Hi YouTube and welcome again to my channel. This time I wanted to talk about the teaching of the faithful and discreet slave. This teaching is literally central to Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, part of their belief that they are the one true religion is based on their understanding of the faithful and discreet slave. They believe that the faithful and discreet slave is directed by Jehovah to provide food to his sheep at the proper time. And based on that, they believe that they have to stick very close to that faithful and discreet slave once they have been identified. And since the faithful and discreet slave is now the governing body after a recent change, that means that they have to stick close to the governing body. So the question is, what really establishes the faithful and discreet slave? Well, scripturally speaking, it's based on Matthew 24, verses 45 through 47, in which Jesus, uh, in a parable, talked about a faithful and discreet slave who would provide food for the domestics at the proper time. So, how then does the faithful and discreet slave establish that they were the individuals that were chosen by Jesus? Well, they state that based upon the restoration of Bible truths and the organization that was to become Jehovah's Witnesses being the only organization revealing those truths and having those truths revealed to them and based on their teachings that they were in fact a faithful and discreet slave. They claim to have recognized signs in the Bible that pointed to fulfillment of Bible prophecy that other individuals did not recognize and that became the central theme of their preaching. So based upon that, they consider themselves to be the faithful and discreet slave. So that provides a very testable hypothesis. The reason for this is because uh, the Bible students that would later become Jehovah's Witnesses published a lot of literature that described what their teachings were. And Jehovah's Witnesses in the tradition of the Bible students continue to do the same thing. So there is lots of documentation as to what the organization that would become Jehovah's Witnesses taught at the time they were supposedly appointed by Jesus as the faithful and discreet slave in 1919. So what the organization currently teaches that the organization used to teach back in 1919 uh, is something that needs to be investigated by everybody who is a truth seeker. But here is where the problem is. Despite the fact that the organization back then uh, wrote lots of literature, it's not always very easy to find. In fact, Kingdom Halls don't keep any of that old literature on hand, and you cannot order it from the society. And any libraries that it's in, typically speaking, will not be those of a kingdom hall. There may be some very old Jehovah's Witnesses or people who have uh, had their, in the, uh, their family have been Jehovah's Witnesses for generations, may have some of that literature, but there are also websites online that have archives of that literature, and that's the easiest way to get your hands on old Watchtower literature. So theoretically, what the organization now says that the uh, Bible students used to teach back in 1919 is they say that they taught that uh, 1914 marked the end of the Gentile times and they say that they were beginning to recognize the signs of Christ's presence and they knew at that time that that meant the end of the world was near. Well, if you actually read the literature from the era, uh, you will discover that in fact they thought that Christ was present since 1874 uh, they originally believed that 1914 would mark the end of Armageddon. None of those things happened, so they needed to make radical changes. Uh, they always did teach 1914 as the end of the Gentile times, but what that meant back then is very, very different from what it means today. 1914 was supposed to mark the end of the time of trouble, not the beginning of the time of the end. It wasn't until possibly the 1930s or the 1940s that the beginning of Christ's presence was moved from 1874 to 1914. So it's not even honest to say that in 1914 they began to realize the signs of Christ's presence because they thought he had been there for 
40 years at that point. So how then does the organization maintain loyalty to the faithful and discreet slave? Well, they do this basically by hiding the evidence. It's not easy to get, as I have said, and they actively discourage going online looking for such things. They print a very rosy picture of what was taught in the past, selecting bits and pieces from the literature to present the picture that they want. They're very good at picking quotations such that it tells you the story they are trying to tell. And the higher up the organization you get, the more intense the indoctrination becomes. For example, I was looking through the uh, latest pioneer book not too long ago, and faith in God is equated as being almost the same as faith in the organization. It is stressed to pioneers that they should stay close both to Jehovah and to the organization, as if they were one and the same. As it's, um, and they base that on the fact that they consider the organization to be the only channel that Jehovah is using. And the pioneers are instructed to keep pace with the changes. There's in the instruction there about how they know that it can be difficult at times to accept changes in doctrine, but that the pioneers have to rely on the faithful and discreet slave. And when I was an elder, we had the same exact training. We had the same exact information. Uh, the organization wants to take those people that are its best servants and make sure that they stay close to the organization. And essentially, in action, if not specifically in word, the organization basically takes on the aspects of God uh, in that the organization teaches you that if you are to question the organization, you are, in effect, questioning God. You are taught that only spiritually mature people will continue to adjust their viewpoints as the organization moves. You are taught that the organization is progressive and you have to keep up with it and you have to keep studying and you have to keep uh, in step with where the organization is going. If you don't understand, you are told to wait on Jehovah. You are taught to think the way the organization wants you to think and you are basically taught to view everything they say as pretty much sacred. The instruction that they get they're actually placing themselves above the scriptures. I say this because they make themselves the only authority that has any ability or right to interpret what the scriptures say. So, if you were to read the Bible for yourself and discover that you were to disagree with the interpretations as presented by the faithful and discreet slave, you would have to ignore what you understood the Bible to teach. And they use a number of different scriptures to support this. For example, they talk about the Ethiopian eunuch, and they, um, he says that he couldn't be, understand the scriptures unless he had someone to guide him. Uh, the context there, though, is entirely different. The things available to the Ethiopian eunuch were consider considerably less than things available to people today. And the Bible can be hard to understand, but once you've begun to read it, and there are things in it which you can certainly understand. And after studying it, you certainly can understand it for yourself. In fact, it's either First or Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all scriptures are inspired of God, beneficial for teaching, for reproving, for setting things straight, uh, that the man of God may be fully competent, completely equipped for every good work. So the Bible tells us that it itself is sufficient to help somebody to understand how properly to be pleasing to God. The organization does not agree with that. The organization says that you need them. You need the faithful and discreet slave to be able to understand the scriptures. So basically what they've done is they've made it such that they don't allow any of the Jehovah's Witnesses to think in any way, shape, or form about anything that's in the Bible for themselves. They always have to do exactly as they're told from the faithful and discreet slave. They have to agree with every single explanation, no matter how foolish it may be. For example, the current explanation about overlapping generations is completely and totally absurd. Unless Jesus were purposefully trying to mislead his listeners, there's no way he meant a generation the way that the organization 
currently describes a generation. So this loyalty to the faithful and discreet slave becomes the primary thing to a Jehovah's Witness. However, with their ever-changing light, they have to enforce that loyalty because any other thinking person would realize the Bible hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Why would someone have to keep changing their interpretation of it? And secondly, if there was one true religion, the way to find it would have to use the Bible as its authority. Otherwise, any religion could claim to be the true religion, they could claim to be directed by God, and they could claim to be the sole authority that has the right to interpret the Bible. And you would have no way of knowing who was who, unless somebody was performing miracles equivalent to Jesus, which nobody does these days. So, for what we have and what we know, if you are to assume there is a true religion, the authority for determining what that religion is has to be the Bible. But the faithful and discreet slave basically does not allow witnesses to use that litmus test, and they actively hide the truth as to what their predecessors taught. And other interesting things about the faithful and discreet slave. It used to be considered that the entire class of the anointed was the faithful and discreet slave. But this was never, in fact, the case. Going back in Watchtower history, uh, at times it was claimed that Russell was the faithful and discreet slave. Um, then the functions of that office passed on to Rutherford. Later on, they passed to the next president, Nathan Knorr, though the main arbiter of doctrine at that time was Fred Franz. And in the mid-70s, when the governing body, as we know it today, came into existence, they accepted that mantle of authority. So there has been considerable change in who the supposed faithful and discreet slave really and truly was. And if you look at the history of things that they've predicted, they have never been right about what they've predicted. The end has been any time now since 1914, and it still hasn't come. People have been told to sell their houses and to spend all their time preaching because the end was so close. In fact, there was articles in the 1974 Kingdom Ministry commending people for selling all their belongings to preach in view of how short of a time was left. Well, that was before I was born. So anyways, that is the faithful and discreet slave. And if you would like to study it yourself, I highly recommend you do, because the information and the history of the literature is not exactly what is presented in the current literature. And furthermore, a second point of interest, which many other individuals have commented on, is that the faithful and discreet slave that Jesus was talking about was in a parable. A parable is not a prophecy. A parable is something that is a story that's used to make a point. So that aspect of the faithful and discreet slave can apply to anybody that has any type of leadership position or oversight position in any congregation. And viewing the parable or the illustration in that way actually gives it a lot more power. So you have to decide for yourself what you think about that. But that is the faithful and discreet slave that currently demands unquestioning obedience on the part of every single one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they absolutely refuse to give any proof of who they are. And if you try to seek that proof out, they will move to silence you. Does that really sound like a faithful and discreet slave? And would a faithful and discreet slave continually have to revise what they're saying? Well, you decide. Thanks for listening.